Uh, our next speaker is Boyd Edwards, um, who is a professor of physics at Utah State University. And uh, the first contribution from him that I noticed on chiasmus was, uh, was what I thought was an extraordinarily interesting article uh, using statistical, the power of statistical analysis to analyze whether, uh, whether the uh, chiasmus, uh, chiastic structures that occurred uh, in the Book of Mormon, I think specifically, were intentional or just the product of random chance. I thought it was a very interesting application. I love areas where there's a melding of a sort of scientific approach to a literary or historical approach. So, Professor Edwards. It's a pleasure for me to be here. I, my co-author is my father, Farrell Edwards. We, until he ret uh, retired last May from teaching physics at Utah State, uh, we were both members of the same department. Um, it is an honor to, to celebrate this wonderful forum. Our uh, objective today is to ask the question, what can statistics offer to the discussion? I'm a physicist, I'm not a literary ana analyst, and uh, I was motivated originally by statements I found on the internet saying that, oh, these chiasms in the Book of Mormon, they're all within the bounds of probability. There's so much extra repetition in there, they're within the bounds of probability. And uh, so that statement, frankly, angered me a little bit, <laughs> and I thought, um, but I have the training to, to either confirm or refute that statement. So the We'll, there, I'll first introduce uh, some of the ideas and we'll do four examples. And in the process of introducing those four examples, we'll introduce the tools that, that my father and I have developed for the statistical analysis of chiasmus and then end with some conclusions. I'm gonna divide chiasms into two groups. Those that are intentional, meaning consciously, deliberately, uh, intentionally created by the, in the mind of the author while he or she was writing the text. He was thinking about chiasmus, he applied it, or inadvertent, which is, was not consciously or deliberately uh, done. Why worry about intentionality? Well, Neil has done a great job uh, saying that. It's all about meaning, because if we extract meaning from a, from a chiasmus that wasn't originally intended by an author, that meaning does not necessarily reflect the emphasis of that author and is therefore kind of um, not, not as interesting. There is literally a flood of chiastic proposals out there. Oh my goodness, you can find chiasmus everywhere. And uh, it reminds me of the Scarlet Pimpernel, they seek him here, they seek him there. There's uh, Frenchies seek him everywhere. You know, and so many of the chiastic proposals are convincing and exciting and, 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 and amazing. Others have doubtful intentionality, frankly. And, and so the, our, our attempt, as, as Neil has discussed too, uh, the attempt is to try and, uh, try and gather some criteria and, and sift the, the wheat from the chaff. So we can offer evaluation tools and in some cases, we can offer evidence of intentionality. We cannot, however, and this is a correction, Neil. Where's Neil? He's here somewhere. Um, a correction. Um, we, we have not proved that the Doctrine and Covenants chiasmus were not intentional. We cannot prove that. All statistics can do is either offer evidence of intentionality or offer, offer no, inten no evidence whatsoever. They cannot say that it was not intentional. So uh, a chiasm that doesn't pass our criteria is not necessarily not a chiasm. It might still be a chiasm, but it just doesn't pass our statistical test. And in fact, there are very few chiasms that do. Uh, the reason is that we set up the test to be as strict as possible. We want it to be rigorous statistically, defensible statistically, and um, and that le leads to fairly strict um, results. Okay, the, the four examples that I'll do, the first two, um, for those, statistics offers no evidence for or against intentionality. It says nothing about them. It cannot say anything about whether these two chiasms, Matthew and a physics abstract, were intentional or not. And in, this, in the final two, 
one from the Old Testament and the other from the Book of Mormon, uh, statistics offers strong evidence of intentionality. And in those two cases, the, the case we believe, the case for intentionality can be considered to be closed, done. They were intentional. The author meant to put them in. Matthew 10 and 39, beautiful structure. He that findeth his life shall lose it. He that loseth, loseth his sa life for my sake shall find it. So A and A prime, find are bo they're both fine. We call those literary elements. So a liter literary element is a word or words that is repeated at least once in the passage. Element B is lose. So it's find, lose, lose, find. This is what we call a mathematically simple chiasm. And the only reason we call them simple is because the math is simple. Why is the math simple? It's because there are two instances of element A. There are two instances of element B. There are no instances of repeated elements that appear elsewhere in the chiasm that don't fit the chiastic form. And there are no extra appearances of element A or B. This is what we call a simple chiasm. So introducing the reordering likelihood, the idea here is this. I have an A, I have another A, I have a B and another B. I'm going to take four pieces of paper and I'm going to write A on the first piece of paper. I'm going to write A on the second piece of paper and I'm going to write B on the next two pieces of paper. So now I have four pieces of paper. I throw them in a hat, jumble them up, pull them out at random and I get a random order. So the idea here is, is uh, by this amazing, um, let's see, just like that. I'm pretty proud of that uh, animation. So we jumble them up, they come out in a random order. How many different orderings uh, can you get? Well, you can get uh, ABBA, that was the original ordering of the chiasm, find, lose, lose, find. But you can also do lose, find, find, lose. That's a chiasm, sure. But you get also ABAB, that's a parallel construction, not inverted parallel, and these other four, other three uh, non-chiastic orders. So of those six, if you do a random reordering, any of those six is equally likely of being selected in a random ordering of these elements. Two of the random uh, rearrangements are chiastic. So what's the likelihood that a random rearrangement will be chiastic. Well, why not just be the number of chiastic arrangements divided by the total number? And the answer is yes, that's it. So the likelihood that you could get chiastic structure in a random rearrangement of the elements of a chiasm, in this case for a two element chiasm, is two, the number of chiastic arrangements, divided by six, the total number of arrangements, and you reduce that fraction to one-third, which looks like 0.33. So in other words, 33% of the time, if you take those A, A, B, B, throw them into a hat, pull them out, 33% of the time you'll get a chiasm. Um, significance level. Statisticians consider a 5% a to be a significant uh, el element. That 33% is not very significant because random, randomly I can pull them out and 33% of the time, yeah, so what? I get a chiasm. If it's 5% of the time or below, then statisticians consider that to be strong evidence of intentionality. So, so it's really, you want a likelihood that's below a certain value. It's, it's good to be under the bar, not over the bar. It's not like a high jump or a pole vault. We're talking about limbo here. It's good to be low. A, a low likelihood of, of occurring by chance means that you can eliminate the, the idea that, that it occurred by chance and then promote the idea that it was intentional. It was not by chance. It was by design. So obviously Matthew 10 and 39 doesn't pass that test. Oh, that means it wasn't intentional. No, it doesn't mean it wasn't intentional. I think the Savior or, uh, or Matthew's transcription of, of what the Savior said, I think it probably meant to make it a, a chiasm. It's just a short one, but we can't provide any evidence for or against intentionality. This is a chart of L values for simple chiasms. Uh, again, I t mentioned that simple chiasms have 
a certain number of elements. In the case of Matthew 10 and 39, it was two. Well, it could be three or it could be four. And you can actually calculate analytically, uh, just with math, what the likelihood will be for these simple chiasms. And it falls to a very simple form. Uh, if n is the number of elements, in, this, in case of Matthew 10 and 39, it's two, then the likelihood that that will occur, um, that likely, the reordering likelihood is 2n minus, this is a nice cool mathematical function, 2n minus one and these two exclamation points, this means a double factorial. So you learned something today. Uh, and what it means is you multiply a bunch of odd numbers to get the result. In this case, one times three is three. And then one over that uh, double factorial gives you the likelihood. Uh, so you can see the pattern with n equals three, uh, one times three times five is 15, and one over 15 is the likelihood. And as you, and you move to four elements, then you get under the value of, uh, of 0.05. So you're, you're suddenly in the regime where you're saying, okay, I think the intentionality may be significant here. Physics abstract. I'm a physicist, I write physics papers. This is one example, I wrote in 2006. A couple of weeks ago in preparation for this talk, I looked at my abstract with new eyes. And between those two square brackets, red square brackets, I found a four element chiasm. Yes, I did. <laughs> and this is it. Take a look. What do you think? Well, uh, flow, flow, two elements of flow. Um, chemical reaction fronts. Wow. Propagation, propagation, solutions, solutions. Pretty darn good, huh? And so I think we said that that should be an intentional chiasm because it has four elements, right? And there it is. There's a four element chiasm. Um, and and the value of, this value of L gives it evidence that the author, who's me, of this abstract, intentionally applied the chiastic form in creating this abstract. There's a problem. Because guess what? I did not apply the chiastic form in writing this abstract. I, I wrote it, and I did not apply the chiastic form. <laughs> so this is kind of embarrassing. The statistics say that um, it must have been intentional, and the author says, uh-uh, it wasn't. I know how I write, and when I write, I, I, I write the abstract, and then I revise it to make it more clear, and then this idea should come before that idea, and then this adverb gets deleted. It's a, it's almost, it almost seems like a random process, but it takes a while for me to come down to, a, to an organization of the ideas that I feel is logical and clear. And, uh, and some might say, well, and Neil talked about this too, uh, what if it was sub subconscious? Neil said, well, hey, you knew about the chiastic form, Dr. Edwards, and so I think you subconsciously created this. I say, I don't think so. I really don't think so. I, uh, is there some mysterious subconscious form that was somehow trying to s compete with my conscious attempt to organize ideas? I don't think so. I really don't think so. Now, I'm not a psychologist, but I really don't think so. So, how to resolve this issue? And the answer is to be honest. What I showed you before with that four element chiasm was not honest because I left off some of the literary elements that were repeated that didn't fit the form. I only showed you the elements that fit the form, and I did not show you the elements that don't. Well, what do we actually have? Well, we, yeah, we have flow and flow, element A, but they appear twice. That element appears twice in the chiastic structure outside of the, of the form. Chemical reaction fronts still appear only twice, propagation only twice, solution only twice, but guess what? There's two other literary elements, element E, advect or advection, that that element is repeated. It could have participated in the chiastic structure, but it didn't. And one other one, direction. Another element that could have participated in that chiastic structure, but didn't. And so what we did uh, is, is I wrote a computer program 
This one is not simple. This is complex because it has these extra appearances. So I wrote a computer program that essentially does exactly what we talked about before. I take these elements, the two, uh, well, the four elements A, the two that appear in the chiasm, and then the two that don't, the B's, the C's, and then the D's, and then the E's, and then the F. Throw them in a hat, pull them out in a random order. That gets boring after a while um, to do it by hand. So we did it with a computer. I did 10 million reorderings of those in a few seconds on my Mac, okay? And I got that the likelihood of a four element chiasm in, in that passage is 0.22. Well, that's a not very exciting. And it's definitely not below 0.05. And it does resolve the issue, the embarrassing issue that the statistics predict intentionality or it suggests intentionality where I, whereas I knew it wasn't intentional. And um, it's just one, one way that, to lie with statistics, right, is to ignore those extra elements. Um, and that's, that's chiasm that could have involved any four of the, of the six elements. There's element A, B, C, D, E, F. And when you rearrange them, it doesn't have to be A, B, C, D, D, C, B, A. It could be any, other, any of the four in any order as long as you, you say four and then you repeat them in a reverse order. So that resolves the discrepancy. Here's uh, a copy of my program. I'm happy to share uh, copies for free with anybody who's interested in copies of it. The number of rearrangements, 10 million, the reordering likelihood of... Uh, so this is the input and output from my, from my program. It's not very user-friendly, but it does work just fine. And the program confirms when you type in a simple chiasm, it's, it, the program is capable of doing simple chiasms. You can replicate all of the uh, values on the table, so it has been verified. Um, so, including those, only those elements that fit the chiastic form. This is a take-home message. And ignoring elements that do not gives misleading chiastic patterns and meaningless statistical results. And can lead to false conclusions as we showed uh, with this physics abstract. However, including all appearances of all repeated literary elements gives truthful chiastic patterns, valid statistical results, and reliable conclusions. Okay, now let's look at Leviticus. One of my all-time favorites. I think uh, Jack showed me this one one day. Um, just beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. And a copy of this is included in, the, in your program. We won't be able to admire it for all of its amazingness, uh, but here's element A. There's seven elements. It's a simple chiasm. Lord spake unto Moses. Lord commanded Moses. Matched up the outer level. Bring him forth. Um, that have been cursed and stone him. Speak unto the children of Israel. The stranger is one, for, one of your country. Killeth a man and put to death. Killeth a beast. Beast for beast. Uh, blemish in, a ma um, in his neighbor. So shall it be done to him. Breach for breach. Eye for eye tooth for tooth. The essence of the Mosaic Law. Right at the center. Not repeated, but at the center. Just as Neil talked about that, the importance of that central element. How does this stack up? Well, it's a seven element chiasm. Um, one times three times five times seven times nine times eleven times thirteen is 135,000. And one over that is a very small number. Is that less than 0.05? Uh, yes, it is, by a lot. So that means strong evidence of intentionality, that the author of this passage uh, intentionally applied the chiastic form in composing these verses. Well, what if that chiasm was a fluke? What if, just like a monkey sitting in a typewriter, he eventually is going to type out a sonnet? You know? What if that was a fluke? How do we determine that? And it was my dad, actually, who's here, um, that said, boy, you got to deal with this. This is an important issue. What if it was a fluke? As the longer the parent work, Leviticus or the whole Pentateuch, the five books of Moses, then the larger the likelihood that a group of words could potentially have formed a chiasm. And, he, and he's right that somewhere in that work it could have appeared. 
So we do that calculation, and it involves several more weeks of my time. So that, that's really good at telling me what I should do. So, uh, so I spent several weeks trying to uh, address this issue. If L is the likelihood that the chiasm appears once, let's, let's take an example with lightning. If, if you go outside in a lightning storm uh, for 10 minutes, let's say you're, I don't know what the likelihood is, but let's say your chances are one in a million of getting struck by lightning, okay? But then if you go out 10 times, then what is your likelihood? Well, it goes up, right? Well, how about if you just multiply 10 times one, one millionth and you get one over 100,000, that's your odds. And that's exactly how we go about it. L is the likelihood that a random arrangement um, will produce its chiastic structure. N is the number of opportunities for such structure in the work. And then P, if you multiply N times L, gives the likelihood that such a structure could have appeared by chance in the parent work. Just multiply those two numbers. But how do you find the number of opportunities? That's a hard part, and that, that it took me several weeks. Um, so I started in Leviticus 25, and I said, Leviticus 24 is where the, the chiasm was. I started in Leviticus 25, and then verse by verse I read through and identified literary elements that were repeated, but repeated only once. So they came in pairs, and then I counted until I had seven pairs. And then I drew a line, and I said, that's one opportunity. And this is one such opportunity. There are seven elements here that, um, uh, but the chiastic structure produced by them is only a two-element chiasm, so they don't produce a chiasm. But that's not the point. The point is that we're looking for opportunities where chiasm could have appeared, but didn't. In order to assess the number of times, uh, number of opportunities for structure, number of, number of times you go out into the lightning storm, et cetera. And based on that, uh, and the number of pages in the Pentateuch, we came up with a number of opportunities of 342 for seven element uh, structure in the Pentateuch. Multiplying that very small likelihood L by the number of opportunities N gives a probability P that the chiastic structure of Leviticus did not appear by, in the Pentateuch by chance. Is that below 0.05? Yes, it is, by a long shot. It's well under it. So we can confidently say that Leviticus 24 was not a fluke. It was intentional. Alma 36. Um, we... These element selection rules are not another list of criteria, Neil, just so you know. <laughs> These are rules that we apply in, in, in using our statistical tools to analyze chiasm. Uh, they're intended, their, their sole purpose in life is to make sure that we're not lying with statistics. It's not a lie and it's not a damned lie and it's not a statistic, it's, it's real statistics here. So the, uh, for example, a rule tool is that two elements uh, two or more appearances of a single literary element must share the same words. Word or words. That's a very strong criterion, and, and it's not, it, it doesn't say what it is or isn't a, a chiasm, but it does ensure that our statistics are valid. And um, we also uh, had to, number four is, is including one word or idea in a chiastic section and its twin. So these rules actually end up giving us a little bit different uh, structure of Alma chapter 36. You may have seen um, structures proposed, uh, I think uh, several jacks might have been, had 17 elements or so. To follow our rules strictly, we only get eight. There's only eight elements. And you can find a copy of this in your, in your program. Um, the outer elements, A and A prime, uh, commandments of God, prosper in the land, all of these elements are, are full ideas. Uh, do as I have done in remembering the captivity and bondage, deliver them from bondage, support in your trials and troubles, okay? And born of God that talks about his limbs, beautiful, beautiful piece, and Jack has written about this as well. Racked with all my sins, uh, memory of my sins, God upon his throne. Central element, Jesus Christ, his appeal to Jesus Christ. This is Alma. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. And we are, in fact, celebrating the discovery of this and other, other chiasms in the Book of Mormon in this conference today, discovered by, by uh, John Welch uh, 50 years ago in Germany. So Alma 36, just to conclude, um, 
gives a very, very, very small value of L and um, strong evidence that, that, that it was intentional. Um, doing the same exercise that we did with Leviticus was Alma 36 of Luke. Um, no, it wasn't. We counted, uh, estimated 359 number of opportunities for such chiastic, chiastic structure in the Book of Mormon. That gives a P of 0 .00018. Is that less than 0 .05? Yes, a re. It is. And so this gives strong evidence that the, that the chiasm did not appear in the Book of Mormon by chance. And you say, well, wait a sec, uh, Dr. Edward Boyd, you can call me Boyd, whatever you want to call me. Um, you, you say, I don't know about this whole number of opportunities thing. It seems kind of random. And I say, even if, you, uh, even if it, this number of opportunities was increased to 100,000 instead of 359, it would still not change our conclusion about intentionality of Alma 36. So I think it's a pretty bomb-proof, uh, well, I think it is a bomb-proof. Um, conclusions. Here are, uh, above the line, are chiasms that have been proposed in many different works that do not pass uh, below the significance level, don't pass our test. Does this mean that those above the line were not intentional? No, it doesn't. It just means that statistics says nothing about their intentionality. There could be other mitigating factors, some subjective factors, things that, that come into, the, into, into play. Um, but the ones below the line do pass our test and the uh, intentionality of those can be considered to be a closed issue in our opinion. Um, conclusions. Valid assessments of chiastic intentionality include all repeated elements, both those that fit the chiastic form and those that do not. Assessments that ignore the elements that do not fit the form are misleading and can lead to false conclusions regarding intentionality. Statistics yield strong evidence of intentionality of chiasmus in the Book of Mormon and the Pentateuch. Then just a few references. Uh, feel free to write to me if you want a copy of my program. I have a copy for PC and one for Mac. I'm not selling it or anything. It's, it's really kind of rudimentary, but it does the job. And uh, thank you so much. Would you be publishing another paper including today's material not formally included? I think we will be. Um, the, we'll publish the proceedings, is that the plan? Okay, yes. And I've actually written it up. I've written up a lot of the new material and happy to send it to you. Feel free to contact me at my email address there. If a chiasm is not intentional, a standard structure order might lead to the chiasm accidentally. This might explain accidental chiasms. Could there still be meaning? I think there can be meaning in an, meaning in an accidental chiasm. Um, it just might not be the meaning intended by, by the author. We've looked a lot, we looked at hundreds of chiasms, my, my father and I, the Doctrine and Covenants, the Book of Abraham, uh, Joseph Smith's writings, uh, the Popavu, um, et cetera. I think there can be meaning extracted even if it's accidental, but it might not mean, might not be the author's meaning. I intentionally put a uh, four-level chiasm in a Journal of Chemical Physics paper. No one found it. Will some future reader think I was Hebrew? <laughs> well, I must be Hebrew because I got four elements in my physics abstract. Uh, <laughs> very good. Um, well, there's, there's a great one in, uh, oh, where, where is it? It's, it's in Green Eggs and Ham. So one uh, article written to disparage the use of chiasms in, in, in Book of Mormon studies said, hey, I found uh, um, a chiasm in green eggs and ham, therefore Dr. Seuss must be Hebrew, you know, so. Uh, who came up with the 0.05 significance level? I can give you a, a, a reference on that. It's the standard level used to, um, can, as used to, uh, as consideration for strong evidence. Now, you might say, well, what about 0.06? What about 0.045? Um, why is it 0.05? Well, it's, it's, it's in some sense, uh, uh, it's, it's actually a competition between setting the level too high and admitting 
uh, intentionality on things that might not have been intentional, and setting it too low and excluding um, intentional chiasms that, that really were intentional. So it's considered kind of a, and it's not a firm thing, but if you're well, well, well below 0.05, as we are in Leviticus and, and Alma 36, you can consider it very strong evidence. If it's 0.05 or 0.1, well, it might be, there might be some evidence there, but it's not considered to be strong. Could some of the elements relevant to chiasms be present or missing due to errors in translation of scriptural passages? Uh, I'd defer to Jack on that one. I'd say probably yes. Um, do elements in a chiasm need to be exactly parallel? Example, law of the Sabbath. Um, I would say no, and I think Neil talked about that, right? For, for our statistical tests, yes. Yeah, you've got to have, I mean, you can't have an element that's um, um, Boyd as element A and Dan as element A prime. Well, we're, they're both men. They're, but they both study chiasms. There's a tie there, right? There's a connection. Well, not for our, our statistics. It's got to be, a, for our statistical analysis, it's got to be a strong connection. But, but I think there might be a great chiasm about Dan and me, right? right? Should we, let's, let's write one. I think, you know. um, are you saying that you cannot statistically prove ABBA structures? Um, that's true. We can't statistically prove an ABBA. That doesn't mean they weren't intentional, though. I think Matthew 10 and 39 certainly was. When do you know ABBA is intentional? And I would leave that to the, to the literary scholars. What do you think is the next Book of Mormon topic that should be investigated computationally? Oh, that's a great question. That's a great question. I don't have an answer. Thanks. <laughs>